Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webcast where WellBuilt and other industry experts will discuss ghost kitchens and specifically how to break the 30 minute delivery barrier. My name is Deb Fryer and on behalf of WellBuilt, I wanna share how excited we are to be joined by such well-known industry experts. And I wanna thank them all for participating in today's session. I'd like to have our speakers introduce themselves starting with Michael from Euromonitor. Thanks, Deb. Uh, my name is Michael Schaefer. Uh, I work for Euromonitor International, or a independent global market research agency with analysts in more than 100 countries. Uh, we build data and insights on a wide variety of industries in my role. Uh, I manage our consumer food service uh, and our drinks research, uh, looking at the global restaurant industry and trends like ghost kitchens. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mandy Quinn, and I'm from Uber Eats. I uh, represent our food service partnerships team and work with restaurants all across the country uh, when they're thinking about delivery for the first time, when they're thinking about setting up virtual kitchens um, or have questions on how to optimize their business. So very excited to speak to some of the trends that we're seeing in delivery in ghost kitchens today. Good morning, everybody. My name is Todd Boulay. I'm the director of culinary sales for the U.S. for WellBuilt. I manage our chef team. We offer field support prior and post sale. Good morning, everybody. I'm Michael Anderson. I'm a director of WellBuilt's Fit Kitchen team. We're a consultative sales service to help our customers with uh, process and flow in the kitchens. Hello, this is John Johnson. I'm with Concept Services. We work with uh, multi-unit restaurant operators all over the U.S., helping them achieve their development and growth goals. Good morning, everyone. My name is Eric Oyama, and I am the director of construction at Kitchen United. Um, Kitchen United is the builder, operator, and facilitator of kitchen centers across the United States. Good morning, everyone. My name is Matt Maroney with Kitchen United. I'm the director of kitchen design and help onboard and uh, work with brand members uh, in, inside our kitchen facilities to have them optimize for ghost kitchens. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. As a reminder to our audience, you'll see on the right hand side of your desktop, there is a Q&A section, so please submit questions throughout the presentation. If you're so inclined, you can submit them anonymously. We will answer questions at the end of the presentation, time permitting. What I want to do now is just spend a few moments speaking about WellBuilt and why WellBuilt and our channel partners are well positioned to support ghost kitchen investors and operators, as well as the individual operators within the virtual concepts in those ghost kitchens. First of all, WellBuilt has over 60 years experience with customers, both large and small, with not only the equipment needed, but also the services needed to ensure their operations are running smoothly. In addition, WellBuilt has a full supply of equipment that's right to outfit ghost kitchens. As you can see on the right hand side, whether it's storage in terms of refrigeration or freezers, we have a wide line of cooking equipment. As you can see, we have holding and custom fabrication and to round it out, we also have dispensing and serving equipment. But we all know that equipment alone is not enough. And so we have additional services to help support our customers. Kitchen Care is our unit that provides spare parts and warranty service to our customers. Fit Kitchen offers multi-unit operators guidance with operating efficiencies and making sure they have the right equipment for the job. And Kitchen Connect is WellBuilt connectivity solution that allows operators to not only manage menus across multiple locations, but also to pull in real-time data that really helps maximize their asset utilization. So now that I've told you a little bit about WellBuilt, I'd like to turn it over to Michael Schaefer with Euromonitor. Thanks, Deb. So what I would like to do to kick off today's discussion is talk a bit about um, what ghost kitchens are, talk a little bit about definitions, share some of our data um, from Euromonitor on the size of this opportunity and talk about some of the ways uh, that we feel that ghost kitchens are going to change really 
everything about how we use restaurants, how we think about restaurants, particularly in this new COVID-19 era. So to begin, I think it's important to talk about a bit about definitions. Uh, you know, for those of you who might not be fully familiar with ghost kitchens or virtual restaurants, uh, these terms can overlap. So when I talk about ghost kitchens, when we talk about ghost kitchens in this, this webinar, um, and, and that's synonymous with dark kitchens, cloud kitchens, often called shared kitchens, what we mean are delivery only kitchens that can be owned and operated by a brand, or they can work in tandem with a third party uh, that may often work with multiple brands. And so Kitchen United is an example of that. Uh, again, any brand using a ghost kitchen can also operate uh, physical restaurants with eat-in service, uh, but an increasing number are virtual only. That is, they operate only for delivery, only working online. And the data I'm going to share with you in just a second, these do not include the kind of commissary kitchens that we see producing for uh, casual dining chains uh, or grocery retailers making that kind of prepared food you see in a Whole Foods. Instead, we're going to focus on those kitchens that are producing uh, for delivery for the end consumer. And again, when I say virtual restaurant, um, that's kind of an offshoot of ghost kitchens. It means those brands that only exist online, they only exist uh, for delivery. You, you can only find them on a third party aggregator service or via their own app. There is no physical restaurant that you can, you can walk into. And so I think that's um, probably the best way uh, to think about that as we as we enter um, into into this new era, there are both ghost kitchens, there are virtual restaurants. Yet, um, you know, not every service using a ghost kitchen is is going to be uh, is going to be a virtual restaurant. We're seeing a lot of examples of players like Chick Fil A others which are using ghost kitchens to supplement um, their their delivery capabilities. And and I think that's a really important point that ghost kitchens are really already a vital part of the restaurant industry, despite the fact that it feels like it was only last year that we really started talking about them. Uh, it feels like around June of last year, everything really, really kicked off, but they've been around for some time. And, and we're already starting to see some of the shifts um, taking place in the industry. Uh, the first is this idea that every player is, is going to have to find ways to, to make delivery work from day one. You know, what Ghost Kitchens above all are about is, is supporting delivery. And over time, uh, particularly in the current era, as consumers become more adept and more familiar with ordering online, we're going to increasingly see every player and certainly every player in the QSR space uh, have to think about, about delivery, in part because dine-in is becoming de-emphasized. This was true before. Um, our data showed, that, and many other sources showed, that the dine-in occasion uh, was not growing, and in many cases was even declining relative to delivery, to takeout, to drive through, to other ways of getting our food. Obviously, um, the current pandemic has has accelerated some of those trends in some ways, and going forward, I think it's it's almost inevitable, and, and particularly in the QSR space, that we will see um, new restaurants, you know, when people start opening new outlets uh, that have a much more even split between dine-in, between delivery, um, between takeaway, no longer solely dependent on, on dine-in just because of uh, our current environment and because of that competition from, from other 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 chains other outlets using ghost kitchens to support their delivery delivery practice um, and then finally i mean i think the, the the big point that really should not be overlooked is the generational shift that we're that we're already starting to see um, this isn't just about covid19 um, when we look at generation z so let's say consumers uh, under the age of 20 to to define it broadly uh, we see a generation that has grown up in the smartphone era uh, that has grown up in the delivery era and it's going to become increasingly difficult for any player not just a restaurant player but retailers and others uh, to justify any demands uh, on their time 
um, to justify leaving the house, to justify spending time to go to a restaurant, to go to a store, even more so in new eras, and in the new era where, where safety has been added uh, to that list of concerns. So uh, th perhaps the, the biggest theme of you know, all of the speakers you know, we'll hear today is this idea uh, of delivery becoming central to what just about every, every player is doing. And, and I think it's really important to keep that in mind. I also think it's important to consider just how big this opportunity is. Um, obviously, there are many estimates of ghost kitchens, how many are out there. Uh, using the definitions I, I shared with you uh, just a moment ago, uh, thinking just in terms of those third-party ghost kitchens producing for delivery and ghost kitchens operated uh, directly, owned and operated by restaurants and producing for delivery, in terms of how many are out there, um, this is still a fast growing space. Uh, it, it, there, there are a lot of estimates out there. Right now, we at Euromonitor estimate that uh, China leads the way in adoption of ghost kitchens. Um, we see uh, more than 7,000 currently in operation. We also see quite a few in India. Um, many of these belonging to, to a, single, a single operator, uh, Rebel Foods, that operates uh, dozens of ghost kitchens across India. Um, and then in the US and the UK, um, you know, roughly we see, we see fewer of these, uh, but this is growing all the time. And we certainly expect that um, over the next the next 12 to 18 months, uh, we're going to see more and more uptick and investment uh, in this space as more restaurants look to take costs out of the system, look to support delivery, uh, and really look to make that happen. Um, because the way we at Eurowander like to look at it is this idea that the ghost kitchen's first era um, is just starting. You know, we've just started talking about ghost kitchens. Now we're really starting to see more players uh, completely integrate ghost kitchens into what they're doing, into how they think about the industry, how they think about their operations. It's not just an add-on to support delivery. It's a fundamental part of what they do. And we're already seeing that in some new concepts that are coming on the market that I'll share with you. And so one example we have here, uh, celebrity chef David Chang, uh, own, owner and operator of uh, Momofuku is probably his best known uh, Asian restaurant uh, in, in New York City, but he has a number of other concepts. One of them is a fried chicken chain, a QSR chicken chain called Fuku. Uh, it's already present in a number of cities, but when they decided to move into Portland, Oregon, uh, they basically used a, an, an all delivery and takeaway um, strategy. Uh, so using uh, existing food carts, but also partnering with a company that uses parking garages as space to, to build uh, these ghost kitchens. And I think this is a really important point that going forward, we're going to see more new concepts that begin as delivery only, particularly uh, when they have celebrity chefs, when they have owners with some cachet, uh, kind of that influencer model uh, that uses ghost kitchens and often third party partnerships to expand at a much faster rate with much less capital investment uh, than we may have seen in the past. And this idea of business models goes further than this. You know, when we talk about ghost kitchens, it's, it's still very common and understandable for us to talk about restaurant chains, to talk about, as, as I said, examples like Chick-fil-A um, using ghost kitchens to supplement their operations. Uh, that's certainly not going away. But for me as an analyst, what is also fascinating is the number of newcomers, of new players that are really looking at ghost kitchens and thinking, well, this, this changes the operation a bit. It means that um, packaged foods players, drinks players, other players can all experiment with food service, which of course, um, from the perspective of a packaged foods player is a very nice, very high margin uh, incremental business to be, to be in. Uh, we're seeing a lot more examples of that. And so one example of that here um, is a player in in, in, in Chile, um, it's called Simplete. They make frozen ready meals, um, frozen uh, dinners, and they've actually partnered with Tastemade and Rappi. So Tastemade makes 
cooking videos. It's like a BuzzFeed Tasty uh, or, you know, one of those uh, sites you see where uh, people uh, can swap recipes and you can download cooking videos. And what you can do is there's a series of videos on Tastemade showing people making various dishes. And what you can do is order a version of these dishes uh, in uh, meal form from Simplete, uh, or you can order the ingredients yourself uh, if you want to cook it. Uh, and all of that is going to be uh, delivered uh, by Rappi, which is a uh, you know, very important delivery chain, a, a, a Colombian delivery aggregator, uh, one of the most important delivery aggregators in Latin America. And so um, I had a, a client say this to me the other day that the new environment um, you know, almost feels like uh, he called it uh, Airbnb for restaurants. And leaving aside uh, some of the difficulties Airbnb is having at the moment, it does speak to the uh, the power of kind of allowing um, just a whole range of new players to open a restaurant to get into this space um, with less capital, less investment than before, uh, and that leads to a lot of innovation and potentially leads to to a lot more competition uh, as as more and more players think about this. And so as we think about next steps, as we think about where to go from here and, and we uh, move towards some of the other speakers as we get into some real world examples uh, of how to operate ghost kitchens, uh, what I want, want to leave you with is the idea, three ideas. First, that uh, over time we are going to see ever more competition for the evening meal. We see it already. Um, we're all at home. We all have 30 more meals a week that we have to try to solve. Uh, some of that is going to persist, uh, but even as we start to venture out of the house and start going back to, to restaurants, and it will happen, uh, we're still going to see ever more competition for that, that evening meal. We're also going to see more restaurants looking to support multiple income streams. Uh, Dine-in is, is a dangerous place to be right now. It's a difficult place to be right now and will be uh, for, for the foreseeable future. And so we're going to see multiple income streams, multiple approaches to reaching the consumer, uh, and ghost kitchens are going to be at the center of that. And then finally, this idea of efficiency over experience. As we talk about breaking the 30-minute delivery barrier, uh, we see the prioritizing of efficiency over experience. We were in an era that was all about experience. Well, that hasn't completely gone away. Um, more and more as we, we consume more of our meals, at home, um, you know, that's going to be a bigger and bigger part of what we do. And so uh, with that, um, I'll, I'll turn it over to, to the next speaker. Excellent. Hi, everyone. This is Mandy Quinn again from Uber Eats. Michael, thank you for doing such an excellent job setting the stage. Um, hopefully those of you on the line are now excited about ghost kitchens and thinking about creating additional revenue streams. And you're probably thinking, well, what will this look like in my restaurant? And so um, what I'm here to talk about today is operationally a little bit more about what this looks like, how you can build efficient um, operations and how you can monitor them using your third party delivery partners. Um, so just a little bit about Uber Eats to kick us off. For those who are unfamiliar, we're an on-demand food delivery app. We are a global company. Um, you probably recognize some of the brands on this page that we partner with, but who you may not recognize are all the individual restaurant operators in the other photos. And I uh, think it's very important to call out that about 77% of our orders globally come from these independent restaurant owners. And about 97% of all of our partnerships are local partnerships with restaurants that have five or fewer locations. You may be on this line thinking, oh, I already know all about Uber Eats. Um, you know, I, I love working with you all or I'm already working with another delivery company. Um, so just to make sure this is relevant for everyone, um, regardless of whether you're working with Uber Eats or any other delivery partner out there, there are three things you should be looking for from them. The first is marketing. That's what this is all about, right? As Michael said earlier, we wanna create additional revenue streams. We want to make sure um, that this company is representing us well as we try to acquire new orders and new customers. The second is speed. We need to know how quickly is our delivery partner getting food to eaters. Obviously, that impacts our quality um, and our overall customer ratings, and we'll talk more about why that's so important in a few minutes. 
Um, and then data. What kind of information can your delivery partner provide you with to help you make better decisions? Now, speed and data are it's circled in red here. Marketing is, you know, the age old technique. It's been around forever. We all know why marketing is important and what we need to do to get that done. But speed and data for those who are new to the third party delivery world are things that you have a ton of control over and they're very important. And the reason why they matter so much for your business, first taking a look at speed, is because 60% of consumers cite speed as the most important factor in their customer satisfaction when it comes to delivery. Speed matters to the eater, and they're more likely to order again from you and to have a favorable experience if they're getting their delivery fast. And the second is that we see innovative restaurants increasing their order volume and making more informed business decisions by leveraging the data their third party delivery gives them access to. Um, so as you think about growing your business, your customer base, taking advantage of unmet needs in your city, all of which are examples we'll talk about here later on today, um, you can use your third party delivery partner to get an advantage in those places. Taking a deeper look into speed, um, this is what a typical order looks like for those who are less familiar with, um, with how delivery works. So first, um, we'll use an, an example of a lunch order coming in around noon. Your restaurant will accept that order. You'll have 15 minutes or so to prepare the food. Um, and about 10 minutes into that time frame, a delivery partner will be dispatched to your restaurant to come pick up the food. Ideally, the food is just being finished and your restaurant is marking that order as complete as soon as the delivery partner is arriving. And then across the next 15 minutes, the delivery partner is taking that food to the eater. So ideally, this is all happening within a 30 minute window. The two pieces of this that you want to think about controlling are the parts in red here. So we recommend accepting orders within 30 seconds or less. Be mindful of where your delivery tablet or POS system is located in the restaurant so that there's always someone nearby who can accept it. If you think about the eater going through the app, there's nothing worse than being hungry, placing an order, and then having to wait and wait and wait just to know that the restaurant has received your order. So 30 seconds or less is the recommendation there. And then marking the order as complete. Again, um, that will give us an indicator as to when a dispatch, we need to dispatch a driver. We always recommend at least 15 minutes or less there. Some tips for ensuring you're doing this well. Um, just make sure your food prep times are accurate. If there's a particular dish or a day of the week or, or a meal period that takes longer or shorter to prepare food during, make sure to update that with your delivery partner. Delay orders that are running late will take care of notifying the eater, of coordinating with the driver, but let us know so that we ensure that flow and communication still works properly. And then mark orders that are done early. There's no better news than when your food is ready early as an eater. So make sure to let us know so we can get a driver to your door as soon as possible. So speed improves your uh, customer satisfaction. It also improves where you are located in the Uber Eats app. If you're able to perform um, restaurant or food production quickly and consistently, you will rise in the app. Some other ways to make sure you're as visible as possible in the app are avoiding canceling orders, being thoughtful about the packaging that you're using, removing menu items that don't sell, make it as easy as possible for the eater to place their order with you. Don't force them to scroll through things that are not popular. And then just be in tune with customer reviews and tweaking your menu um, and operations accordingly when you see corresponding feedback. So that's a little bit about how you can control speed and things you should be looking for to make smarter decisions. Um, now let's talk about the data component of all of this. So there are three opportunities that we see restaurants really taking advantage of when it comes to data that their delivery partner gives them access to. The first is creating virtual restaurants. So reaching an entirely new eater base uh, based on an unmet cuisine need, an unmet price need, um, or some other need in your area that's not currently being served. 
The second is cost savings and operating efficiencies. There are some examples of this on the right hand side of the page. You can see an, a column labeled operations, but it's important to look at your data to understand where did we miss orders? Where did we simply pass by on an opportunity to earn money? Where did we have inaccurate orders? What shift was that during? Who was there? Um, is there some equ equipment we should be investing in to make sure this doesn't happen again in the future? And then the third opportunity we see restaurants taking advantage of is innovation. So if you are thinking about experimenting with new dishes or concepts, um, test them out with your delivery business first. It's a lot easier to just update your virtual menu online for a temporary short period of time and revert and make changes as needed. The um, column on the left hand side under sample data shows total customers, for example. So if you're adding something new, maybe a vegan option to your menu to try and attract new eaters, it's really uh, clear to see the impact that those changes are having using the data. Obviously, this session today is all about ghost kitchens and virtual restaurants. So using all this data to create delivery only concepts, we've seen nothing but success with. Um, and on average, our restaurants see about 70% incremental growth for new concepts that they create. Here's just a couple of examples. On the left, we talk about a small business. On the right, we talk about a multi-location partner. Uh, the small business on the left is a local burger shop that launched a healthy bowl option and was able to bring in nearly 25,000 additional dollars in their first month with the creation of that bowls uh, restaurant. Um, they pretty much doubled their business when they launched their virtual concept. The second example is a multi-location chain that was able to launch a virtual concept to increase weekly sales as well. Not every story is um, quite as successful as the, the, the small business example on the left, but if you're smart about the virtual concept you're creating and using data from your third-party delivery partner, you will see um, some incremental success. Um, last but not least, for those who are, um, again, sort of new to all of this, there's just a couple of pieces to point out um, as you're creating your menu. Your menu, again, is your, your online presence, your, the marketing that you're doing through your delivery partner. So you wanna make sure you're focused on dietary needs and preferences for the eater to make it as easy as possible for them to order. Um, and you want to think about what will increase sales the most, including photos is very important. People like to order what they see pictures of. So including a photo with every, um, every option on your menu is key. And then think about larger portion sizes, adding drinks, add-ons, and all of those things that will help, um, that will help increase your overall ticket size. Last but not least, signing up for delivery is very easy. This is um, the Uber Eats sign up page. Uh, we would love to talk to you if you're interested in learning more, um, but we just need some basic contact information to get in touch. Um, and with that, I will I'll turn it over to the next presenter. Great, thank you so much, Mandy. I was really intrigued by this whole idea about speed. Now I'd like to turn it over to Todd and Mike on the well-built team. Well, good morning, everybody. Today, I'm going to review this as a view of a chef and how my menu is key, how I need to think of this differently. This is not brick and mortar. I have no hostess slow in my door. I'm not holding tables like I would in a restaurant setting. I need to push my menu out as fast as I can with consistency. The better, the faster I can be, the more successful and more profitable we become. With Brick and mortar, my design may have more legacy equipment because my kitchen is larger. Um, I've not transitioned to that speed dynamic yet. And to be honest, that may be all I've known or thought I've ever needed in my kitchen space. I have a larger staff, individualized preparation focus with stations in the kitchen under that formal brigade kitchen style setup, chef, sous chef, station specific. I serve quality products, but I'm focused on how my patrons' experience is remembered in that social setting versus my speed to the customer. Where my ghost kitchen, my kitchen will and needs to be smaller by design. 
clearly, regardless of concept or a chain style operation. I'm designing for speed for equipment that is multi-purpose. And an example of multi-purpose, let's use combi technology. I can steam, bake, roast, air fry versus a traditional convection oven, which only does or has one purpose. Think of those multi-purpose opportunities in, in this kitchen space. I need to think of speed with menu efficiencies, bulk preparation, rapid execution, and my environment needs to be set up to execute that. I will have less staff in my ghost kitchen. They will be cross-utilized during preparation, execution, focusing on bat batch preparation, and that rapid build and execution element. I need to be ready to evolve and adapt, not only with my menu, but with my equipment if need be. Plug and play is helpful. So selecting multi-purpose pieces of equipment at the time of my design is definitely gonna help me adapt more easily. And I'm not gonna be confined to that legacy equipment's one use that I'm so used to having. So transforming for speed, my menu is, is key. And in, in, in looking at the menu, limiting items that you know are just to my top sellers, limit my LTO items to um, food that I can prepare quickly, items that might be trending in my delivery radius to really spark that interest. Tweaking my menu items is also key. I need to consider modifying any menu items that I might be able to prepare faster, either by their cooking processes or how I build and package them to help speed my service up. I wanna also consider family style. Will a family sized offering sell my delivery radius? Because preparing more portions may take the same time as if I'm cooking one. And those steps to produce that won't increase, but my throughput and profits will. And also, how will this affect my current design flow if I haven't thought of that for larger production of each item? I need to make sure that my food will withstand the delivery time under 30 minutes. Do my cooking processes lend itself to be packaged? I wanna make sure that I test items to even in to-go containers um, and modify as needed. Prepare something, hold it for 30 minutes and see how that food product actually looks like the guest would get it and modify from there. If I'm making something that's crispy in a fryer, could I oven bake it? Would that hold better? Good possibility. I might consider deconstructing items to maintain quality. Do I need to place a sauce over an item or could I keep that sauce on the side separate, which helps me with my quality through the drive time. My final cook temperatures in holding temperatures, if I'm hot holding, are they high enough to withstand my build process of that, that item and its packaging and its delivery? I want my hot food hot upon arrival. So when we look at equipment, there's a couple of photos on the right-hand side. Um, I wanna consider new technologies to help increase speed, quality, reduce my footprint, optimize with ventless options where I can, and incorporate some advanced hot holding items to really ease and speed my service. So I think quality and speed go hand in hand. You know, you'll see on the top right photo, there's a line with some speed equipment, some combi technology, advanced hot holding, all with touch screens. And this is really going to allow me with those touch screens and the new technology to pre-program cookbooks and cooking profiles, recipes that ensure my quality. Testing and validating of my items through some of these platforms really is going to give me that one touch profile to cook uh, regardless of who's doing the cooking or who might be in the kitchen and their skill level. It makes it consistent every time. And then my training is more about loading versus the actual cooking process that's taken care of for me going to make sure I focus on that right piece of equipment to speed up my process as well. Um, I want to enhance my food quality. So let's just look at a standard steamer. I might consider a pressure steamer. Um, it might be faster, but if I consider combi technology, it may do a better job for me. It may me allow me to do more as a multi-purpose piece of equipment, and it might even be faster. Um, a legacy range top. I use for sauteing, simmering, holding sauces, reducing, swapped out with induction will increase my speed. It's gonna allow me for more precise temperature control. And it also 
will reduce my environmental heat in that kitchen. You know, even having a salamander or a specific oven to finish, to brown, to glaze, uh, consider a speed oven that is also multi-purpose, not only just to rapid finish, but to cook items as well. I think footprint and, and ventless go hand in hand. With our advancements in ventless options, it clearly allows me to reduce my hood space or, or might even remove it completely in my cooking footprint. I'm able to stack some of these items. The two ovens on the right in the top photo, I can stack those. I can move the advanced hot holding to the front line where it should be, or even maybe put that above the mini combi, and I've, I've shrunk that space in half. And, you know, with ventless, I, I can even now consider placing my equipment next to my station where I execute the food during my peak periods, and I, I don't need to conform to that linear legacy hood space design setup. And when I think of incorporating advanced hot holding into my kitchen, you know, let's be honest, the QSR and LSR operations globally have this figured out. They've perfected it. Their systems are precise. If we adapt to some of those systems and we just substitute the food out, it might be a chicken patty or a burger, but well, it could be a grilled chicken breast. It could be, you know, my skirt steak for my fajitas, um, keeping moist and tender foods moist and tender, keeping crispy, crispy. So when we think about transforming for speed and processes for that, you know, we've talked about menu and types of equipment, and now we'll talk about some of the processes with with cooking and how the, the equipment is different from brick and mortar and how I need to change uh, for that speed mentality. If we look at batch overnight production cooking and quick finishing processes, I think they're key into the operation where your batch and overnight, batch cooking, blanching, par cooking, blast chilling, maintaining higher food safety um, is really key and it helps me with fast execution. And I wanna consider this and implement this as much as I can. Um, bringing some food items closer to that final cook will speed my process. It's probably not gonna work for everything in the kitchen, but the more I can do that, the better it's going to be. Even if I'm able to blanch some of the vegetables for a stir fry, that might speed up my final cook time and assembly of that dish. You know, utilizing my equipment when there's no staff around is key as well. I'm going to save on the labor and I'm still going to get the job done. Overnight's perfect for slow and low of roasting and cooking. I can prepare my pulled pork for my carnitas tacos or for my barbecue or even roast and slow roast the top round to do my signature roast beef sandwich. When there's no staff in the kitchen, I'm not taking up space during peak hours or during peak hours. And then when I match this with some rapid finish and equipment um, and taking those bulk and batch procedures into play, an item that might have taken six to eight minutes to cook or finish might take only two to four minutes now. Man, that would really speed up the process for me in the kitchen. The right photo shows um, some quick finish options, a uh, speed oven on the top left to uh, an impinger to an induction wok hob and a combi oven. The top left has a panini that can be cooked in 45 seconds or less. If that's one of my top sellers, I might consider building 20 or more prior to service or, or even calculate my preparation to my par level of what I sell for that day. And then it becomes speed of execution versus needing to prepare that item solely for an a la minute type scenario. So an example that we're gonna talk about is rice, just to, to kind of put this into perspective. Um, an Asian concept had a pain point where they were struggling to keep up with rice production for their peak meal period. Rice was a side dish. Rice is used with the entree. Rice goes with everything that's going out the door and even used as the entree with additional ingredients. They were unable to really keep up with the rice production during that peak period. And a 60 cup rice, rice cooker has a space of 16 inch width uh, make 60 cups in their recommended manufacturer directions. It takes just about an hour with hold time after cook time. Well, even if I have two of those in a linear space of 32 inches, that's just about a small 610 combi that will produce 210 cups an hour. It's going to be multi-purpose for me. It could be ventless 
and it's really going to allow me to do more. How long does my rice cooker stay idle? How many rice cookers do I have? If I have four or five, that's, you know, could be five feet of linear space or more. And it only does one thing. And if you look at some of the addition to the right, um, your return on investment could be pretty fast with something as simple as looking at rice in your operation. So an example here, another example of, of equipment and swapping for speed is your traditional flat top griddle to a clamshell express grill style in your operation. You know, my flat top griddle is very valuable for me, but where speed is my focus, I'm going to consider alternatives. You know, my, my legacy flat top needs attention with turning, flipping, checking internal temperatures. Um, it doesn't have a timer on it. I'm the timer. And does it really drive consistency? It will if I have the same cook working that station every shift, every day throughout the life of my establishment. And we all know that is not going to happen. So that clamshell grill with that easy touch controller that I'm pre-programming um, my, my menus and my, my items, it's going to allow me to select a profile, load the equipment, hit start, and it's going to cook exactly the same every time without me really needing to focus on turning, flipping, or watching what's happening. And my products are going to be consistent whether I cook one burger or maybe even eight might be that same cook time. And in the red circle, you're going to see a griddle versus a clamshell with just a burger. The cook time savings is two minutes and 40 seconds. And that's pretty significant if I'm selling 30, 40, 50, or 100 burgers per shift. And how can I really maximize on my throughput? You know, that lost opportunity, even if it's 20 burgers per my peak hour, I'm losing 50,000 in profit for that year. And, and keeping in mind too, less expensive equipment does not always mean it's the highest return or the best solution for your operation. Well, this, this concludes my portion. And I know I've scratched the surface briefly on these topics, and I would love to have the opportunity to discuss them further in more detail with you, so please reach out. And I thank you again. I'm going to turn it over to Michael now with Fit Kitchen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, again, I'm Michael Anderson with uh, Well Built Fit Kitchen team. Uh, today, I'm going to talk with you a little about how Fit Kitchen can assist you in the uh, Ghost Kitchen sandbox and speed up your current operations. So, Fit Kitchen is a service unique to Well Built. Fit is an acronym for Food Inspiring Technology. Uh, and I think that's really where our team excels. Uh, our ability to design stations that apply current technologies to help improve speed of service and process. Uh, we're a small team of industry experts that combine culinary, operations, and design. Uh, although we are small, uh, only five of us on the team, uh, we're able to pull experts from our portfolio of manufacturers and innovation teams into projects, uh, and typically do. Uh, so Fit Kitchen can help answer some of the questions our customers typically have been asking. Uh, how do I start a ghost kitchen? Uh, are there equipment packages that can speed up service? How can I reduce labor? How can I do more with less? And how do I design my kitchen for safe distancing? So let me walk you through a little about our process and our ability to integrate change. Fit Kitchen has a comprehensive strategy that focuses on five key areas of operation to integrate technologies and improve speed of service. Right sizing the kitchen, uh, not just for Mother's Day, but for every day. Uh, balancing labor around stations, integrating new technologies and equipment platforms, reducing movement around station adjacencies and improving flow, and uh, simplifying operations, uh, making it easy to train, uh, easy to execute. You can see this example of uh, the spaghetti diagrams to the right. Uh, the top shows the before labor deployment. This was uh, an older design that had equipment band-aided to it as the menu developed over time, which is pretty common for most operations or mature operations out there. Uh, you can see the different colors apply to positions in their labor deployment model and the uh, movement required to execute dishes. Uh, in the bottom diagram, uh, after we applied new technologies like conveyor ovens, uh, induction hubs, uh, advanced holding, you can see the dramatic difference in the amount of crossover and steps taken for each position. Uh, overall, we were able to achieve over a 50% reduction in the amount of movement in each station, which greatly improved their speed of service. Uh, 
Uh, also, keeping your teams happy. Uh, there is a war on talent out there. Uh, not, not a lack of labor to pull from, but uh, a good employee will leave an operation that has a complex working environment versus one that's uh, easy to operate. And that's, uh, that's one of the biggest issues we hear from our customers is around training and, uh, and the revolving door. Uh, some other examples around kitchen improvements. Uh, here's some case studies of projects we conducted. Uh, the first one is around a family dining chain. Uh, their request was to develop a smaller footprint kitchen uh, to help make a more appealing franchise model and uh, go into more urban environments, which is typically what you look for going into a ghost kitchen, uh, reduced footprint that can go into non-A-site real estate. So for this particular customer, uh, we took our team into their kitchens and uh, observed their day parts to look for pain points. Uh, we hung cameras, uh, we did time and temperature checks, uh, ordered and ate a lot of food, uh, just to develop a base for the, the speed and quality. So from there, we went back and worked with our culinary teams to look at changes in process and uh, integrating new technologies. Uh, to use Chef Todd's example, so if you're currently cooking burgers on a, a flat top, when you look at uh, clamshell technology, uh, you reduce the cook time by half. Well, not only that, you have to look at the adjacent stations as well. So if your fries are still taking about the same amount of time to cook, uh, you're just going to end up with a cold burger sitting in the window. So we take a very holistic approach to balancing the kitchen for flow. So for this customer, uh, we were able to reduce their labor by 40%. Uh, a lot of that was around their prep processes and, and single-use equipment. Uh, 100K savings and construction costs by reducing the overall size of the building. So that included uh, like exhaust hoods and, again, a lot of single-use pieces of equipment. Um, this also helped reduce their energy costs by nearly half. Uh, we're able to add more capacity to their assembly stations by uh, fully utilizing vertical space and creating station cockpits, and really eliminating all, all necessary movement. Uh, and then added the ability to integrate an LTO program. That was a big part of their, their operation as well. I think the best part of this was there was this fear from our customer that uh, we're going to come in and recommend uh, expensive new equipment that they would just never be able to afford. But what happened was they ended up with a smaller, more productive kitchen that produced food hotter and faster with a return on investment of less than a year. So that turned out to be a big win for their franchise model. So another good example uh, this was more of a polished casual concept, and their goal was around producing labor. So again, we took our team in for observations. Uh, we brought along some team members from Delfield and Cometherm, and we were able to create a new heart of the house assembly station that allowed them to eliminate two full-time employees, uh, reduce their overall kitchen size, and balance their overall workstation. Again, with uh, an ROI of less than a year. So my point to all this, uh, when you start looking at outfitting your ghost kitchen, take a good look at your equipment platforms. Sometimes a less expensive initial cost will end up costing you more over time. Speed is key for a delivery model. You have to be able to produce hot, quality food fast. Setting up your ghost kitchen for flow is just as important as equipment you select. Sometimes even setting up a low-cost mock-up of your kitchen can really help you understand where you may have pain points. So our well built teams are here to help as, as well. If you need more understanding around some of the technologies out there today, or you need support reducing your current kitchen size to work within a ghost kitchen footprint, we can help. Uh, go to our website for more information on Fit Kitchen and our culinary support teams. I thank you for your time today and hope you enjoy the rest of the presenters. Great, thank you, Mike and Todd, I appreciate it. Now we'll turn it over to Concept Services and Kitchen United. And starting out is John Johnson with Concept Services. Thanks, Deb. Uh, I'm willing to bet that if I was to ask everyone here on this webinar today, uh, what is a ghost kitchen? There'd be a lot of inconsistency of the answers or even a good deal of silence as most people really don't know how to define them. Not that it makes you all feel much better, but I really don't have a clue either. In many ways, the term is very organic. It's changing daily, and I fully expect that we're truly not going to fine tune our definition for them for some time. We might even evolve into a different term altogether. But I have been fortunate enough to be involved with a few of these projects and observe some things that might be relevant. There are numerous types of ghost kitchens, some of which are just virtual brands that are operated out the back door of existing brick and mortar restaurants, like the ones Mandy mentioned. Taking advantage of the infrastructure and equipment that's already in place, these locations already have an online presence 
then they draw all the revenue from the third party delivery service and are completely dependent on those partnerships. I don't have any experience there. Mandy covered that well for us. So I'm going to focus on two other types, which might be more aptly called a kitchen center. These are large facilities housing numerous brands and several separate operated kitchens or a facility with one large kitchen producing for several virtual brands. Typically for these scenarios, there are three possible entry points. Scenario number one would be just a simply a, a room or a section of a larger room with a maybe 10 to 15 feet of exhaust hood, your own walk-in cooler, freezer, or any other type of refrigeration, but then you outfit the rest of the equipment with what you deem necessary to execute your menu. There will still be a good deal of work to be done prior to opening, plumbing, electrical, gas, possible local permitting, that will all need to be worked out. Contractors will be brought in to perform their work, you'll get inspections, and then you'll get your health permit. This would be very similar to a remodel into an existing shopping center that just happens to have a hood and walk-in already. Still a decent amount of work to be done, but it usually takes less than 35% of the traditional amount of time. Next would be another similar space in scenario two with the same 10 to 15 feet of exhaust hood and cooler freezer equipment, but this time throw in some basic prep table, sink, shelves, and maybe some additional refrigeration equipment. Again, you outfit the rest of the space with your equipment, whatever you deem necessary to execute your menu, but not quite as much this time. There'll be less plumbing work to be done, which is good as drains and work in a slab can be costly and time consuming. The needed gas and electrical work will still need to be done as well, like before, but less so. And still there's a lot less time than traditional construction. Last of all, we have yet another room. But this time it is completely stocked with all the cooking equipment, prep tables, refrigeration, other equipment that you need to run a basic kitchen. This is by far the quickest situation for getting yourself started. No gas work, no plumbing, no electrical, no permits, no contractors. But let's be honest, you're probably gonna wanna do a little bit of tweaking. This is common, can often be accomplished without any reinspection and possibly just some tweaks to your procedures or even a slightly different piece of equipment than what you would traditionally use. The scenario that best suits your operation will be what dictates the level of customization you need to achieve your menu. Whichever way you go, as Todd mentioned, these type of operations all strip away everything that goes into running a restaurant except producing and packaging the food, which will be typically consumed off premise. There are no hostesses, bartenders, waiters, no menus to clean, no silverware to roll. You don't have tables to wipe down and bus or any of the other front of the house responsibilities typical in a restaurant, with one exception. When placed in a heavy consumer area or an area of heavy foot traffic, these kitchen centers can also offer a customer accessible component that allows for call-in, walk-in, or online takeout orders through a system that is typically provided by the facility operator op or a partner. More so than building a typical brick and mortar restaurant, there is an enormous amount of work and planning and expertise that goes into building these facilities. The site selection, construction criteria, parking, design flow, HVAC, plumbing, utility, all of these take on new meaning and all these have to have an immense amount of consideration long before opening. The good news for the tenants is most of the details have been taken care of for you, making these facilities have a much easier entry point, both financially and physically, and offer a rapid speed of opening from the time you sign on. They also typically come with their own staff prepared to assist with the opening process. These folks can help with modifications to your menu, ways to create more travel friendly operation offerings. They can help simplify your processes, adapting your recipes, or even selecting alternate equipment and much, much more. An interesting comparison to another type of food service operation is that of the airport concessionaire. The typical operator looking to create a virtual or ghost kitchen is going to encounter many of the same challenges they do when they bring in a concept into an airport. Whether they're a local brand, regional chain, large national operator, there's several challenges each face. Things like smaller operating spaces versus the street side operation, or what in the ghost kitchen world we refer to as brick and mortar. There's restricted utility supply, limiting what they can and cannot have for equipment. There's procedural adjustments. Ghost kitchens have their own challenges. 
but they don't have to deal with the TSA. There's a different supply channel structure. You have shifted to all takeaway meals. Many, if not most of the airport locations are preparing food to be taken elsewhere for consumption. There's a need to limit the menu for speed and volume as compared to the street side operation. There's also a need to consolidate production into more versatile equipment, increasing speed and volume. For instance, that piece of equipment you use to make nothing other than a funnel cake has got to go. Besides, funnel cake will not travel well and can you imagine the powdered sugar explosion if dropped in the delivery driver's car? Mechanical and exhaust limitations will come into play as well, but fortunately there's a lot of potential equipment decisions that can eliminate the need for gas or exhaust requirements. And last of all, there's the needs for speed, the reason we're all here. Everyone in, in an airport is in a hurry, at least we used to be, and product throughput is king. If you want to excel as the best delivery option, you gotta get that delivery time down to 20 to 25 minutes with a product that travels better than traditional cooking methods we are all used to. I personally believe the increase of demand for our off-premise dining is going to drive new technology and cooking equipment and alter some of our views of traditional cooking techniques as well. Regardless of where the food is prepared, you must be able to execute your menu with a complete system producing a high quality off-premise meal. Some of the people closest to earning the title of a ghost kitchen expert are the folks at Kitchen United. We're fortunate to have two of their people from their project execution team on with us today. Eric and Matt are going to go in, are going to share some of their insights with us on the process of managing the build out and maximizing footprints within large kitchen centers. Take it away, guys. Thanks, John. Um, John definitely hit the mark on kitchen centers. They do require an enormous amount of planning and expertise. Finding that perfect look, finding that perfect building for a kitchen center is not easy at all. There's many things that you need to consider. Um, for instance, when you're building a when you're building a you know quick service restaurant, you're building it just to build out one restaurant. When our kitchen centers are being built, you're looking at multiplying that restaurant or that kitchen space, and we're looking at anywhere from six to six to six to ten different kitchen concepts. So what you have to remember is that now what you're looking at is you're multiplying your needs of everything. Two things that I want to look at are more kind of like your MEP requirements, which are your mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. Um, is there sufficient electrical gas? Is there sufficient water? If yes, that's a huge box that you just checked off. But in most cases, there are going to be upgrades that are going to be required. And unfortunately, those upgrades take time because they eat away time because you have to work with the coordination and work with the utility providers on the design, and that's your first phase. Then getting your design approved and getting it signed off, then getting your utility provider out there to actually do the work is going to be dependent on the municipalities that you work with, and that takes up even more time. Fortunately, you can try to do that in, in coordination with your build at the same time so it doesn't affect what you're doing, but if there's something that goes wrong with your MEP upgrades, what it does do, it's going to backlog your progress on getting your CO to actually operate that building. The next thing would probably be your project location. Is it an urban project? So if you do have an urban project, how many stories, which story are you located on? You preferably want to, want to be located on the ground level, but then that's where the problems come in with your HVAC because say you have a three-story building. Now what you have to do is all of your HVAC equipment where will you house that equipment? Will that equipment go on top of the roof? And if it does go on top of the roof, is there enough, is there a direct passage for your ducting to get up there? What's the tonnage capacity of the roof? Say for example, the tonnage capacity of the roof cannot fulfill or meet your, your, your needs. Now you have to find an alternative area to place that equipment. Not only that, you have to work with your landlord but you also have to work with the city. So maybe the city will say, well, you can run a duct up, up the side of the building, up to the roof, but then now you have to go back to your landlord and work with your landlord because maybe they don't want that or they don't feel that aesthetic with the building. These are just certain, certain things that as a builder of a, of a kitchen center, these are things that maybe when you're coming into this market or to this industry, these are things that are not being looked at. And that's why I think it's very important that thinking two steps ahead or the ability to adapt and be flexible come into play. Um, what this allows you to do is to be proactive, not reactive. And this will allow you to deliver the build that you want. Um, 
the next thing that I wanted to get on was um, building smarter. As we build, uh, we're continuing to learn, and that's a must in building smarter. John described three kitchen scenarios. At Kitchen, at kitchen United, what we try to follow is more the scenario three. It's the most preferable because it offers a turnkey solution for the restaurant or the concept. The only thing that is required on the restaurant or concept side is obtaining their health permit to operate in our kitchen centers. Another thing that we try to do is we want you to disrupt the status quo. We do that by listening, refining and changing our needs. And we do that by listening to our members. Um, an example that I want to give you is in some of our kitchen centers, we have walking cooler, co uh, walk cooler combos outfitted into the kitchen space, whereas some do not. This works well for some as they enjoy the quick access to the walking cooler combo. But on the other hand, we have some members that don't prefer that because they feel that the walking cooler combo that is situated and outfitted into the kitchen takes up too much of their operational space. So as we are growing and as we are building, then we work with our we work with our members and our partners to find solutions, optimal solutions that will um, cater to each of our members. And I think going forward, the challenge that lies ahead on the build side will be the requirements put into place as a result of the current pandemic. It's definitely going to you know cause project lead times to lengthen, and it's going to take innovation, open mindedness to shave some time off of that and off of the project lead times. Um, with that being said, I want to thank you for the opportunity. I hope everyone continues to stay safe. And now I'll pass it over to my Kitchen United brother, Matt Maroney. Thanks, Eric. Uh, just wanted to jump in and, you know, again, thank Wellbuilt for having us and, and the rest of the panel. Uh, you know, we're trying to create value uh, for you in this in this new realm. and. Uh, we'll jump in as in an operational mindset, similar to how Todd did with a uh, chef mindset on it. You know, as you know, most that have worked in kitchens and and in restaurants, it's a ballet. Uh, you know, stay in that kitchen flow and, and finishing. Uh, this is not a four wall structure. Uh, I think that's the hardest thing for brands and some of our members to get over as they start to talk with us and as they start to approach ghosts or virtual kitchens or whatever we want to call them this week. Uh, you know. The kitchens are built for, you know, how many orders can they push out per day? Uh, that can range from, you know, 50 to 75, up to 500, up to 1,000. Uh, you know, as as others have, have commented on, uh, you know, the ghost kitchens are are built to prep, produce, and package. Uh, you know, it's it's a strictly focused production facility, uh, but it is, you know brand level food and and what comes out of typical restaurants and four wall spaces if you're if you're entering into this you need to be dynamic and flexible the the ability to shift and sh shape and and work through your menus and really pull that data as mandy said from uber eats uh to to see what's working you know don't be afraid to pull things off your menu that you know work well in a four wall space they may not travel well uh, you know, similar to the experimentation, you're able to turn on and off uh, menu items and even menu categories if, if they don't work well for you. Uh, you know, in entering this COVID pandemic, uh, you know, the, the inventory and market availability is going to be a huge push uh, going forward as well. Uh, you know, really refining your menus and seeing, you know, what's available on the market. We've all seen uh, meat plants and chicken plants and pork plants. Uh, you know, say that there's going to be a shortage, so you need to keep that in mind, especially when you're delivering uh, food out to, out to folks. Uh, you know, the, similar on the equipment, uh, you know, this this stuff does pr boost production and, and your training, smart equipment, combi ovens, uh, you know, things that that can be linked to an iPad that you can load in from a back back end and, and disperse out to 100 stores or 1,000 stores or even 10 stores, uh, you know, really think about those things. Do they do they cost a little bit more upfront? Absolutely, but uh, you know, it'll pay dividends in the future. Uh, one thing that doesn't get talked about a lot is, you know, packaging as your ingredient. Uh, this is just as important when you're when you're working on your food costs. Uh, you know, you get into a container and then you have a sauce on the side and then you have a bag, then you have utensils and then you have napkins. That stuff adds up, uh, you know, upwards to a dollar in cost just to you for for one food item. So when you when you are 
costing these things out in your kitchens, you know, make sure that you're putting those into the equation. This is kind of an example of uh, our Austin facility. Uh, this is this is 280 square feet of usable kitchen space. Uh, this is a, a small local concept in Austin, uh, voted as the best Korean fried, fried chicken. They're getting ready to launch with us. So I figured I'd share this with you. Uh, you know, we provide a baseline of equipment that's grills, griddles, freezers, uh, flat tops, six burner stoves, uh, and fryers, you know, that they can set up and operate underneath what we provide and grow from there. Uh, they have a simple and a streamlined menu. The simpler, the better in this delivery delivery phase. You know, if you're looking at product product mix reports on your on your digital channels, focus on the top 10 sellers and really refine your menus and, and, and go after those. That's what people are searching for. Uh, we'll will highlight as well as Mandy did. Pictures are super important for people that that do shop on their phone and, and do shop on their computer. Uh, you know, and their digital strategy is very important in this as well. The cross utilization and uh, you know to develop your menus. You know. Think about what your categories are. Your category could actually be a menu item. Uh, say you have, you know, a Tex-Mex concept. You know, do a tamale and really shrink that down into a footprint uh, on the category that you give them choice of chicken, beef, and pork, and then sauces on the side. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to write out every single menu item. So really get it honed in on that. Uh, prep efficiencies where you can where you can jump back and forth on on different menu items. Uh, are you making 12 sauces for 12 items? Or are you making four sauces for 12 items? Uh, you know, and then you can run multiple menus. So there's a few members that we have in our kitchen centers that that run from three up upwards to eight different menus off of one line in less than 600 square feet. So it's really about utilizing those those efficiencies. Uh, you know, some and get, getting that customer traction and loyalty, you know, really getting back to, to honing that. Uh, you know, something as simple as a card uh, slipped into the bag, make sure you slip it into the inside of the bag and staple it and, and you know, make sure you have that, that barrier that delivery drivers can't reach into each, each one of your customers' bags. Uh, you know, running through COVID and, and seeing just some great examples out in the industry at, uh, at Seattle, uh, you know, they've done a lot of great different menus, started their own delivery service, uh, you know, really heavily marketed on social media. Uh, Talk, uh, the reservation platform that turned and flipped a script uh, here in Chicago. And then Asian Mint down in Dallas, they've, they've worked really hard to do some great meal kits with a, uh, you know, some, some cryovac and sous vide portioning uh, in one large bag. You know, so those are some great examples that you can feed off of. Uh, you know, innovation and adaptability will lead will lead the charge here in our in our new world, if you will. Uh, you know, that's not only inside your four walls, but inside your communities. You know, if there's five restaurants around you and you guys all work together, you can build your own delivery network. Uh, you can you can market and and social do social media together. Uh, you know, we're all in it together out there, and you know just. Just focus on the on the details and and grow from there. Just want to say thank you, and uh, I'll kick it back over to Deb. And I appreciate your time today. Great, thank you so much um, for all the presenters. Really appreciate the time and effort you put into preparing and then being a part of this call. So thank you very much. Um, in the essence of time, we're going to jump right to questions. So I'm going to forego these summary slides. Um, I do have all the emails for the presenters here on the slide, so please do reach out to any of them. We have pulled questions that have been coming in throughout the day as well as as part of the registration. So I'm going to go ahead and start off with the first one. I would love for each of the panel members to give me um, what you see as the top success factor to running and operating a successful ghost kitchen. So um, maybe start in the order of the presenters. Michael Schaefer, uh, sorry to put you on the spot. Maybe go first for that one if you wouldn't mind. 
Sure, not at all. Um, I think, I mean, looking uh, not just in the U.S., but at, at other examples outside the U.S., uh, one of the big things I would point to is uh, ghost kitchens and delivery, uh, but ghost kitchens in particular, when they work, it's because they're not an afterthought. They're not just an adjunct to existing operations. It really is about using them, as many of the other panelists have have, have shown, uh, to, to rebuild your entire operations, uh, to take advantage of, of some of the new opportunities that Ghost Kitchens provide. So really focusing on, on throughput, uh, focusing on how distributed it can be, uh, not thinking of it as just, um, you know, an auxiliary to, to say it's your dining room. Great, thank you. Mandy, what about you? I hope my presentation uh, was clear on this topic, but I would definitely say speed. And there is a lot of information that you'll have access to once you launch your ghost kitchen um, that can help you improve that metric. Great, Todd? Really analyzing your menu and your processes to make sure those go hand in hand so that you're doing the right thing, uh, producing the right food, designing your space the right way to just maximize your throughput and sales opportunities. Great, Mike? Yeah, I have to agree with Chef Todd. I think really looking through your menu, do a good 80-20, look at products that travel well, and then really setting up your kitchen right to begin with. Select the right pieces of equipment uh, in, the right in the right location so that your process and flow um, makes it easy to execute your dishes. Great, John? I would say looking at the, uh, considering how your food is gonna be received, uh, how's it packaged is gonna be a key factor. And then also how it's prepared and do you need to change from what you've done in your street side operation? Does it need to be done a little differently so that the product that the customer gets is of the best possible quality? Because no matter what, happens that quality and whether the they felt they got a value is going to fall on you the operator and it's not going to have any consideration to who brought it to them or if they picked it up themselves good how about eric and matt um i would have to agree with speed um i think on you know as not just from the operator side but from a consumer side I think that's what you're looking at, right? Is the speed of the product and how you're getting it and how it's being delivered to you, but also what the quality of it is. Excellent, Matt. Last but not least, uh, organizations and, and systems. Uh, you know, being able to you know plug and play a system that you know from prep to execution is is vital and key to to break those speed barriers. Fantastic. So this next question I'm going to throw out to um, actually anyone on the panel who, who wants to answer, um, but what do you see as one of the most common mistakes that folks make when they move into the virtual environment or when they uh, open up their first ghost kitchen to, to host multiple kitchens? I'll jump in and say uh, probably going into it thinking that the way they operate and the way they do things in the ghost kitchen is going to be exactly the same as how they do it in their regular um, operation. It's not going to be the same. And you've got to go into it knowing that it's going to be different. Excellent, excellent. Um, Matt or Eric, I'd love for you, you guys to jump in too on this one if you wouldn't mind. I'll jump in. Uh... Menus way too big, uh, you know, not not having a focus or, or structure to that menu and really being able to, to execute at a high level. Great, fantastic, thank you. Um, here's one, and it's interesting because we do see some national or large regional chains moving into ghost kitchens. And so the question is, how do you balance the shared labor or space with the desire to maintain IP integrity? I'll take the IP. Uh, you know, we these kitchen centers that that we build and operate and function. You know, there there's a strong sense of community inside of them. Uh, you know, the IP is is important to some of the larger chains and and QSRs uh, as well as fast casuals. But I think you know there's 
there's a strong sense of respect uh, in each each one of those. Uh, you know, we have, you know, three large QSR chains in Chicago that we have had zero problems with uh, any of this happening. So, uh, and they've all been operating over a year long. So, uh, you know, having the having that sense of community in in there, you know, it's definitely a respectful barrier. Great, thank you. Um, here's another one, um, maybe for uh, Todd and, and Michael Anderson. The question is around wastage control. How much can you pre-plan when you're going into an operation like this? You know, this could be a very deep discussion, but developing your preparation in line with your sales per menu item, per shift, per day throughout the week. Um, this could be from bulk items right down to dressings and sauces that you pre-prepare. Um, FIFO rotation is key to maintain that. Um, also be ready to prepare less for each peak period. As it begins to slow down, prepare less if you are cooking in bulk. Um, be diligent with kitchen, station, line checks, preparation par levels, keeping waste logs accurate, adjust your preparation as needed. You know, and, and if costs are in line with your menu, maybe purchasing pre-chopped, pre-prepared items that will help with some of that bulk preparation waste uh, could be something to consider. Mike, jump on in. Yeah, I think just to add to that too, Chef Todd, um, I think today people are not eating more in the traditional meal periods like the breakfast, lunch, and dinner, uh, including myself. I, I find myself having basically one meal a day and then kind of grazing throughout the day. So I think more uh, just-in-time cooking versus cook to hold. That way you're not having to discard product that's timed out. And then, again, I think packaging too is key. Like to, to, to select the correct packaging to keep hot items hot, cold items cold, and be flexible enough to work with the majority of your menu so that you don't have to uh, order in uh, different containers for and take up all your storage space as well. Great, thank you. A uh, very pertinent and relevant question during these COVID times is how can virtual kitchens convince their customers that their processes are hygienic, um, given that there's no eyes that can actually see the kitchen? Matt or Eric or John, do you guys have uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I can jump back in since uh, I operated the Chicago, Chicago Kitchen Center for over a year. So, you know, it's very... We have a very detailed process uh, and standards that are met both by members and our uh, guests. Uh, you know, being able to to take take the comfort that the kitchen center is upheld. We use a lot of technology and checklists that uh, ensure that that that's happening and that the hygiene is kept clean. We actually have. You know, in Chicago alone, have been inspected uh, three times over the course of a year. So, uh, you know, and as as each kitchen out in Scottsdale opens, there's a health inspector on on the ground, and that, it varies from municipality. But I think it's you know both our responsibility and the brand or members' responsibility to help share share that. I'll actually jump in with one detail. Of, I read a study recently that. Um, the majority of consumers aren't as concerned with the restaurant as the rest of the diners. And just by nature of these concepts, stripping away everything that's in front of the house, the the comfort level should go up. Um, what they've shown is that most diners are more concerned about the person sitting at the table across the room and have more a higher comfort level that the operators are following procedures and cleaning and putting out quality food. And I think that's somewhat evident by the fact that through everything we've all been dealing with, takeout has flourished. So I, I think just by the nature of their design, there's some built-in comfort. Great point. Here's a question that seems to have Eric all over it. What is the target real estate property for the development of a ghost kitchen, ground up construction or remodel? I would say the target real estate um, would be something that's centrally located in a city um, with good traffic flow. Um, not just for you know for your um, DSPs, but also uh, for foot traffic, um, and with it being centrally located, um, it will create an ideal delivery radius. Uh, when you're talking about ground up or remodel, um, that totally depends on the timetable that you're looking at. Um, I believe if you're looking for speed, then you would want to go with the remodel. Um, 
but going up with the ground up, what ground up will allow you is the freedom for your design. Um, whereas the remodel will kind of handcuff you because you're you're going to be limited to the defined space that you're going to be able to work with. Um, on the last part where um, who maintains, replaces the kitchen equipment. Um, at Kitchen United, we offer a standard equipment package um, that we, you know, that we offer to our members that come into our facilities. And K Kitchen United is responsible for the maintenance and service. However, we do have members that bring in their own specialized equipment. And on that end, for that equipment, that is something that the actual restaurant um, operator or member is responsible for. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Um, John, here's one for you. What are some of the major layout alteration challenges restaurants are facing when changing from a majority dine-in to a highly effective ghost kitchen? We covered that a little bit on the uh, presentation, but would love to hear your summary of that. We did cover it a little bit, and um, I'll, I'll be honest, there's not typically a ton of alteration to the layout that has to be done. There's maybe some swapping of some equipment or and oftentimes more than not, it's it's the operator bringing in the specialty piece of equipment that they need for their operation. Todd touched on this some, but the bigger challenge is the uh, the change of mentality to working in a smaller space and the employees performing more of a multitask role because you, you strip away all the components to, con to uh, the restaurant except the kitchen, it kind of can be a little intimidating to some people. You know, they're working in a smaller space that serves a dual purpose of prep and production. And, uh, you know, depending on your roots, it can be a bit of an adjustment. Um, in the beginning, lots of folks will probably feel like they're on top of each other, so to speak, because, you know, they're, they're not used to not having, quote, an audience, whether it be in a display type kitchen where the customers can see them or just the staff coming in and out of the kitchen all day long throughout the shifts. So I think more so than the alteration to the layout, I think it's more of a change to some mental alterations that are really going to be the bigger challenge for many people. Great, thank you. All right, so I think we have time for one last question. I think this is probably John, Eric, or Matt. What are you seeing as typical square footage requirements for various menu volumes? What criteria is used to determine the right size building as well as the size of the individual kitchens? I'll chime in on the square footage of the actual building. Um, what we look for is it's dependent on you know what what size and how many concepts you're going to facilitate in your building. So for example, our Austin facility, we have 13 kitchens in there, um, also with a front of house, and that is roughly um, about 9,000 square feet um, versus what we have in Scottsdale. Uh, we have 14 kitchens, so you have an additional kitchen, um, but you know, it, it's a bigger space in Scottsdale, roughly about 12,000 square feet. Um, but I would say if it really depends as far as how many kitchens you're trying to get into your facility. Um, so I would say ideally um, anywhere from 6,000 to about 9,000, 10,000 square feet would, would be sufficient. And I think the guys would agree with me, the, the square footage per individual unit kitchen, it's going to depend on, you know, the level of your menu. And you know, as everybody stressed, you probably need to have that 80-20 rule and pare down the menu. But those units will probably tend to operate somewhere between 300 to 350 square feet. All right, fantastic. Well, thank you all. I want to thank again Euromonitor Uber Eats. Concept Services, Kitchen United, and Todd and Mike from WellBuilt for participating in today's webcast. All of our emails again are on the screen. Please reach out to any of us uh, if you'd like to learn anything about ghost kitchens. So with that, I wish you all a great rest of the day and thank you again for your time. Mm -hmm.